So hello, and here we are coming down the home stretch. Um, thanks for hanging in there. I'm really excited about this panel. Um, I'm Beth Robinson. I uh, am on the Vermont Supreme Court, and my job here is mostly to get out of the way. Um, I feel like a Cub sports reporter charged with interviewing LeBron James and Serena Williams. <laughs> it's, uh, um, these really are, and I think you all know this by now, especially uh, most of you who were able to see the argument yesterday, the rock stars of our profession as, as lawyers and, 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 and judges and legal professionals. Um, we talk a lot about Daniel Webster. He deserves all the praise we've given him, but these truly are the Daniel Websters of our generation. And um, so it's just an honor to be on the stage with them. Consistent with their modesty, they both said, oh, just skip the introduction thing and, and, and let's get right to business. And I, I will mostly do that. Both of them have resumes that are far too long to uh, begin to capture in an introduction. But I just want to make sure you, you know a few key facts about them. Uh, Gregory Gar is a partner at the law firm of Latham and Watkins in DC. Um, and he is chair of the firm's appellate practice. He's argued in front of the US Supreme Court 43 times. Um, many of those in his capacity, he, he, he started, he, he went through the Solicitor General's office, he was Deputy Solicitor General, Assistant to the Solicitor General, and Solicitor General itself. Uh, he, he's the only person apparently to have held all three of those posts during his career. Um, his Supreme Court wins includes successful defense of the University of Texas race conscious admissions program. He had a win in the case of Florida versus Georgia, which is an interesting original jurisdiction case between two states about water rights. Um, and a, a win in Vance versus Ball State University, which is a case about employment discrimination. A recent study found that he prevailed in more five to four cases, one vote margin cases, before the Supreme Court since 2005 than any other advocate during that period. So I'm looking forward to finding out his secret to winning those five to four cases. Luck. Huh, luck. luck. He graduated from Dartmouth in the class of 1987, which by the way, I was not. I was in 86 if anybody was paying attention to the introductions yesterday. Um, he went to George Washington University Law School. Following his graduation from law school, he clerked for uh, Judge Anthony Sirica of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit, and then Chief Justice William H. Rehnquist of the United States Supreme Court. Um, it's great to have him here, and he did a fabulous job yesterday. Now, Katyal is a law professor at Georgetown and a partner in the law firm of Hogan Lovells. He was Principal Deputy Solicitor General in 2009 and 10, and again uh, in 2000. 11 with an act, a stint as acting solicitor general in 2010 and 2011. Uh, my notes say that he's orally argued 37 cases before the US Supreme Court, but as of Wednesday, uh, that's actually 38, uh, 35 of them in the last nine years. His high profile wins include successful defense of the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, successful defense against the constitutional challenge to the Affordable Care Act, and a successful challenge to President Bush's military tribunals at Guantanamo Bay in the case of Hamdan versus Rumsfeld. Uh, he clerked for the United States uh, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, as well as just Judge Guido Calabresi of the US Court of Appeals. He graduated from Dartmouth in the class of 91 and attended Yale Law School. The Attorney General in 2011 awarded him the highest civilian honor given by the US Department of Justice. His other honors are too numerous to list, but include one of the most 40 influential lawyers of the last decade, nationwide, by the National Law Journal. And uh, my favorite in the very long list is one of GQ's Men of the Year in 2017. <laughs> His writings are ubiquitous in major law reviews and newspapers throughout the country. If any of you watch TV at night, you've seen him on virtually every major nightly news program including the Colbert Report, if that's where you get your news. <laughs> and he recently played himself, arguing Supreme Court case against the Solicitor General in an episode of House of Cards. So with that, um, I think probably a little more background is in order. I want to start by asking each of them to tell them a little bit about their path to their current roles or, their, or the role of Solicitor General. And what, if anything, about their years at Dartmouth foreshadowed or prepared them for their time as Solicitor General. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here today and, and being so welcoming. It's been a real true privilege of being a part of this um, 250th anniversary celebration. It's been really spectacular for us um, to, to share in this. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I've 
experience in connection with these events is meeting so many students who seem much more focused than I was about what they wanted to do and how they wanted to get there. And, and you know, specifically in a career in law, and, and that was not me when I was at Dartmouth. Um, it never would have even occurred to me that I would argue one case in the Supreme Court. Um, I wasn't focused on that. I was, I, 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 I to this day, um, um, am angry at myself for not taking Professor Sarzinger's class on constitutional law. Um, but I did study government, uh, and government gave me a, a deep appreciation for the workings um, of our federal government, the separation of powers, and ultimately led me to D.C., where I studied law and, and you know, continued that fascination with government. And, you know, ultimately, I think, uh, led to a career in appellate Supreme Court advocacy where, you know, oftentimes we're sort of a, a, a small player uh, in this great process where the Supreme Court is elaborating our, on our laws and, you know, recalibrating this, the separation of powers. And, you know, one of the most enjoyable things about um, being able to do what we do, which is a great privilege, is just, just seeing that process, having that small role in that. And, and I think all of that loops back directly to, um, you know, much of my time here at Dartmouth and the studies that I had here. Um, so I want to begin by thanking everyone for this amazing event, and, and in particular, Justice Bassett, um, for, for doing just, uh, I mean, the amount of work. I've seen it behind the scenes and how, how hard it's been, um, and I just can't thank him enough. And I also just wanted to say um, thanks to Greg, because this has been really fun to do with you. Um, and, uh, you know, we are in a very competitive bar um, in the Supreme Court, um, but the truth is we are all, all the, the people um, who've been in it for a while are, are good friends, and um, it's been just really fun to do this with you. Um, so for me, my path was totally circuitous. At Dartmouth, I got obsessed with teaching, and in part because I had really good teachers, and I thought that's what I wanted to do, and in my senior year, I thought I would, uh, go to graduate school in history and ultimately teach history. And my professor, Doug Haynes, um, told me, well, maybe you should think about um, teaching in law. It's an easier life. And I said, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I decided to apply to law school, but with the idea that I would be an academic. Um, I went to Yale Law School where Akhil Amar, who's somewhere here, um, basically took me under his wing. I wrote a lot of articles. I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. And I did that for a long time. Um, I wrote a whole bunch of theoretical articles that I still can't understand to this day, um, <laughs> and, uh, and thought that was gonna be my life. And in 2001, after the nation was horribly attacked, um, you know, one of the things that President Bush did in response was set up those Guantanamo tribunals. And I felt like even though I was a hawk on national security issues, um, I, did, I, did, I felt it was deeply un-American, and so I decided to file a case on that. It was really, I mean, I'd argued one appeal once in my life, but that was it. So this was really my first case, um, and when it got to the Supreme Court, I tried to give the case away to someone else. I tried to give it to Ken Starr, um, and, uh, and, and he wanted to do it, but his law firm wouldn't let him, and then I tried to give it to another person in the Supreme Court bar, Miguel Estrada, a very prominent conservative lawyer. And Miguel said, yes, I'd love to, but let me just check one thing. And he calls me back 20 minutes later and said, sorry, yesterday I signed an amicus brief on the other side, a front of the court brief, I can't get out of it. So I knew how committed he was to his amicus brief um, at that point. Um, so anyway, I decided to do the argument. I'll, I'll tell you, you know, if it comes up, I'll tell you a little bit about, about my first argument. But um, when I won that case, um, after that, it opened up new possibilities because it was a daunting case to win. And then companies wanted to hire me and, uh, the, and Barack Obama as a senator got in touch with me and that opened up those doors to the Solicitor General's office. But the bottom line is, up until I was 35, 36 years old, I never thought that I would be a lawyer, let alone a Supreme Court lawyer. I thought of myself as an academic. Well, I think I'm going to go off my outline here and start with, why don't you tell us, each tell us about your first oral argument in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. And Niels is much more interesting. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so it, it was Guantanamo, as I was saying. Um, and when I was clerking for Justice Breyer, 
we saw, this was before, you know, the, the Supreme Court bar was starting them, and there were amazing people like John Roberts who would come and argue before the court. But a lot of the arguments were by people who were just plain terrible. And we all joked about how we should create a Supreme Court malpractice law firm <laughs> and sue these people um, for, uh, for, for, for their jobs. And so when my case was granted, I, that was literally my first thought. Oh my God, I'm going to get sued for malpractice if I do this. Um, I wasn't really worried about being sued, but I did flash back to that whole set of stories and those conversations and think it'd be irresponsible for me to argue this case. Um, that we should have, first of all, someone who was identified as conservative, second, someone who knew what they were doing, and third, someone who wouldn't pass out at the podium. Um, <laughs> so that's why I tried to give the case away. Um, you know, and I got a bazillion calls from other folks who wanted to do the argument, um, but none of them really had the time. This was a massive case. Um, it wasn't just Guantanamo, it was also the Geneva Conventions, do they apply to the war on terror? And four days after the case was granted by the Supreme Court, Congress passed a bill to try and to remove the case from the docket of the Supreme Court for the first time since the Civil War. So there were all sorts of huge meta issues. And I couldn't find someone who was gonna devote three months to just this case. So I decided to do it. And the way I decided to do it, I said, listen, if I'm gonna do that to myself, I said, I'm gonna do everything humanly possible to be as good as I can. So I took a legal pad out and I wrote a list of all the people across the country who scared me the most. Um, lawyers, not like Frankenstein. Um, and um, so Elena Kagan was on that list, Harold Coe, Akil, a bunch of people who were just, you know, Lawrence Tribe and so on. Um, and I went and I mooted my case in front of all of them. And everyone who I emailed said, yes, I'm happy to moot you, except one person who I know is friends with many people here, Charles Freed, uh, Reagan's Solicitor General. And he wrote me an email that said, you know, Neil, I could lie to you and just tell you I'm busy, but the honest truth is I have respect for you and I just want to tell you the truth. I don't want you to win, so I'm not going to help you. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I did that. In my very first moot, Lawrence Tribe, I did this at Harvard in the moot courtroom, and Lawrence Tribe said to me, um, uh, you know, you look a little small at the podium. And I thought about it and I said, it's true. I'm really deferential and kind of back on my heels. So I did something I don't know that any other member of the Supreme Court bar has ever done. I hired an acting coach. I hired a guy who was on Cheers. He was one of the people at the bar. And, um, and he helped me just try and get a little bit of presence with, at the podium. Um, you know, most people, like Greg, I think have it. I didn't, um, and I had to work at it. And um, so I did, and then um, I did 15 moot courts, 15 preparations all around the country, um, and then showed up at the argument, um, and uh, it went okay. <laughs> Neil did a fantastic job at that oral argument, and it was, you know, truly a, a very significant case uh, for the country. So that was that was amazing. Um, my my first argument came when I was a lawyer, a career lawyer at the Department of Justice in the Solicitor General's office. The Solicitor General's office, which maybe we'll talk a little bit more about later, is basically a relatively small unit, only about 15 to 20 attorneys. Uh, in the Department of Justice that handles all the litigation in the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States, its agencies and officers. And so as a junior uh, lawyer in that office, your first oral argument traditionally is one you're either going to win 9-0 or lose 9-0. And mine was one that I lost 9-0. Um, it was a, an amicus argument. So the United States comes in and participates as a friend of the court. It's not a party in the case, but it comes in to share its views with the court. And so there were about 10 minutes. It involved uh, an extremely obscure issue of Indian tribal sovereign immunity uh, in the arbitration context, something that you know you would never hear about again except for this case. Uh, and I survived, and that was the whole goal. Uh, I think you know one, one of the you know 
nice things about working in the office and having multiple opportunities to argue before the court is eventually you can get a little bit more comfortable and eventually you can get to the point where you can kind of actually, you know, think in the moment of what's going on as opposed to, I just want to live through this and sit down and, you know, not, not just faint, which is what your first argument experience is like. Yeah, that reminds me. So I was so nervous before my argument. Every day for a month, I woke up terrified. And I remember going to the court the day before the actual argument to watch. And the clerk of the court at that time, Bill Souter, he, um, he did not want me to win. He was, in, he was an Air Force JAG, and I had the Navy JAGs at my side, and there was a lot of rivalry, and he really didn't believe in what I was doing. And so he put his arm around me, and he said, Neil, you look a little nervous. And I said, yeah, I am. It's my first argument. It's a big case. He said, don't worry. Only three people have died with their boots on. I said, what do you mean? He's like, three people have died at the podium. And I said, I thought it was a joke, but it's actually true. <laughs> Including, oddly, a man argued a case, I think, in 1900 and passed away from a heart attack. And then his son argued a case 40 years later and passed away. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a scary thing. Wow. <laughs> so you've... You've both argued a lot of times in front of the 38, 43 times in front of the Supreme Court. I'm sure you've argued in front of um, other courts as well. You've also clerked for appellate courts and the Supreme Court. So you've been on both sides of the bench. Given your experience, how important do you think oral argument really is in the resolution of cases? I mean, our jobs is for it to be important, so we have to say it is important. And, and I actually, um, I, I think it is important. Um, you, you know, it, I think the, the most important piece of advocacy in any case, I think, is the legal brief that the judges and justices are going to read before they get on the bench. But oral argument uh, is critical to, you know, most cases, I, I think, in my experience. I mean, as a, as a clerk, I certainly saw cases where if I were going to count votes going into the argument, I would say the case would come out this way. Even votes that were, you know, in Supreme Court decisions, but then a case would come out a different way. And so I, I, I know for a fact that cases have been won at oral argument that way. And Won or lost? Uh, well, won and lost, actually. I mean, and that's the other part of it, is it's very easy to lose a case in oral argument. I mean, you can have a case that looks very powerful in a brief, and you can literally see, you know, the air come out of the argument during the course of an oral argument, where you've got a list of hypotheticals, you give one bad answer, and it leads to another bad answer. And you, so, you know, an argument that looks very, um, you know, persuasive at face value just literally collapses, and I think, you know, we, we've both seen that. So the bottom line is I, I think it's uh, very important. Yeah, I don't think I'll, I can improve on that. I think that's exactly, you know, my answer as well. The one thing I might do is just uh, take the beginning of your a question which is about clerking for a justice because um, particularly in the first argument or two like you're so nervous and it's so helpful to just go up there and look at someone who's known you for a year and knows that even if you give like the wrong answer he doesn't think you're an idiot um, so that was very helpful I mean my second argument is actually I was just as nervous maybe even more nervous for my second one so my second one was this um, uh, pro bono case involving the class of one theory of equal protection. And the month before the argument, um, Greg and I were actually giving a speech together to the National Headmasters Association where we horrified them by playing a game of beer pong. Um, and uh, not during the speech, but... Uh, um, and one of the headmasters asked Greg this question. He said, what do you do when you uh, are going to argue a case that you don't believe in? And I remember Greg's answer, which was, um, you know, by the time I've invested all of that time and energy and put all of my persuasive skills and my team's persuasive skills on something, I am persuaded. Um, and so I haven't had that happen to me. So I stood up for my second argument and I was nervous as all heck. And right, I got up to the podium and my only thought was what Greg said and then my further thought was, I don't believe a word of what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, somehow I got three votes. I still can't understand how I got three votes. So some folks here may not have seen real live oral arguments in the United States Supreme Court. They saw a facsimile yesterday. What about the real experience? Compare, compare what they saw yesterday to what it's really like and 
resist the urge to compare the quality of the bench in the two examples? Um, the quality of the bench was superb. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I think it was, it was um, actually pretty close to what it's like because, you know, we talked about yesterday, I think the oral argument in the Dartmouth College case took place over several days and was nine hours long. In the Supreme Court today, in most cases, you get 30 minutes aside. This Supreme Court is by far the most active of any Supreme Court in history. Uh, during the course of a 30-minute argument, if you, you know, what I've done is I always go back and count, and it's not unusual to get um, 70 sort of questions slash interruptions during the course of that oral argument. If you do the math, that gives you like precious little time to answer the questions. So, you know, one of the things that was maybe not totally representative yesterday is you and I had a little bit more time to talk than, than often than you do during an oral argument. But really, it's, it's that give and take, the, the question and answer, that, that is the, you know, the heart of the oral argument. And it and, and honestly makes it a lot easier, at least from my perspective as, as an advocate. The most nervous I ever was before the Supreme Court was during an oral argument where I'd gotten about almost 10 minutes in and literally had maybe one question. And it was, it was, that was the only time when I was at the lectern before the Supreme Court and I was looking around thinking to myself, hey, this is really strange, I'm arguing before the Supreme Court. And I was terrified. Um, every other case, you get up there, um, by tradition, the court will give you, you know, maybe 30 seconds to, and I'm serious, I mean literally like my prepared text for an oral argument is a paragraph and, and sometimes you're lucky if you get that out and then you immediately get hit with you know, questions and then it's just you know, back and forth like that for the next 20-30 minutes. Yeah, I basically, I think I averaged 68 questions per 30 minute oral argument um, and uh, um, normally I write out, I have a paragraph that I hope to get out. I no, almost never get the paragraph out. I usually could get, if I get a sentence out, I'm happy. Um, but uh, once in, I had Ashcroft versus Al Kidd, which was, um, I was defending former Attorney General Ashcroft on the war on terror and abuse, alleged abuses of 5,000 individuals. And all the headlines was, there's gonna be a war at the Supreme Court and so on. So I was prepared for battle and I had my, um, my paragraph and I got through my paragraph, no questions. And then I'm like, God, what do I do? What do I say? And then uh, I just gave another paragraph, no questions. Then I'm like, okay, well I can do this for a little longer. So I start talking a little more and I'm looking at the justices, like, ask me a question. And one of them just smiles back at me. And I, you know, and then one takes pity on me and asks me a question. And, um, and then I got like two more questions. And then I said, if there are no further questions, I'll sit down with 21 of my 30 minutes to go. And what was very clear at that point was they all agreed with us. And there was no disagreement. And the other person got up in 30 minutes of hard questioning, and I had 21 minutes for my rebuttal. And I basically said, are there any questions? They said, nobody's asked any, so I sat down. Um, so that, that's the nice, you know, that, that, that almost never happens, um, but uh, it, it can. I guess one thing that's really interesting about the court and oral argument is the justices haven't always talked to each other about the case much beforehand. And so they're using oral argument to talk to one another and you are just the ping pong ball in the middle that is trying to facilitate a conversation between them, which makes it very different than I think a lot of other types of advocacy. I thought the questions yesterday were very representative. They're hard questions that you, um, you know, as an advocate, you want to have rehearsed your answers to in some way in moot courts and the like. There are two ways in which the argument yesterday was different. One is, um, at least Greg was funny. Um, and uh, um, as an advocate, you can't really do very much humor. Maybe, maybe you can get away with something once in an argument, um, but the Chief Justice is a very funny individual, um, and you let him be the funny person. Um, you are not the funny person. Um, and then number two, uh, I think this is probably self-evident, but the peroration at the end that I gave Daniel Webster's statement um, it, even Greg couldn't get away with giving that in the real Supreme Court. I mean, you would, you might be thrown out if you did something like that. I mean, any emotion is really very disfavored. And I remember when I was arguing the travel ban case last year at the Supreme Court, at one point I started to get emotional. I could feel it in my throat. 
and, and it was a very emotional, high stakes case. Um, and I remember thinking, I have to do everything in my power to not let it show. Yeah, the, the other thing that's unusual about the Supreme Court, which is really nice, and for any of those who were in D.C. a month or so ago, you probably saw this, is the advocates are very close to the bench. I mean, almost, in my experience, there's almost like an inverse relationship as you go through the court system. When you're in the district court, you're very far away. Oftentimes, the bench is elevated, and there's one judge staring at you. Get to the Court of Appeals, you get a little bit closer. In the Supreme Court, you know, it's a very... Um, um, cordial atmosphere, at least you know, in the abstract. And so you're right there. All you really see is the justices in front of you. It blocks out the rest of the courtroom. And that has the, the ability to sort of facilitate this conversation, which is you know, essentially what you ideally want to have with the court about your case. But you know, as, as Neil said, um, you, you know, you've got this dialogue with the justices on the court. And so you're answering their questions. And you know, th there's no more, you, know, you, you want to do nothing more than to agree with the justices' questions. But it's particularly if it was like someone like a Scalia or a Kagan, you want to agree with them because you know that if you don't, it's not going to be fun. Um, but the, the minute you sort of go along with Justice Scalia on his sort of theory of the due process clause, you know, someone else is going to jump up and give it to you from the other side. And, and you sort of quickly learn that. So there's this constant, you know, back and forth on the court where, you know, your goal is to maintain a consistency of position that, you know, will get you to five votes, uh, even if it means sort of not accepting, you know, all of the help that some of the justices are going to give you. And, and, you know, frankly, some of the times the critical moment in cases during oral argument is the questions that some justices are asking, the points that they're making that can turn off other justices. I and mean, I think that was particularly true with, with Justice Kennedy and some of the questions that members of the court, even Justice Scalia would ask in lines of inquiry that would you know, maybe turn off him and push him in a different direction. I mean, one thing that makes Supreme Court advocacy different than arguing in lower courts is they're not bound by precedent. And so in lower courts, the question is, what is the law? And in the Supreme Court, it's what should the law be? And that's why there's so many hypotheticals at the Supreme Court about the logical consequences of your position and why you know, what Greg and I do is different than, and it, there's a reason for a Supreme Court bar, um, and it's because we're used to answering those kinds of questions. Um, and uh, I think the most important thing I'm doing in my preparation is figuring out what are the four corners of my argument. How far does it go? What can I concede away? What can I say is in the heart of my argument? When you're building an argument, and, and, and I'm going to put aside the cases that aren't the hot button ideological cases, which is probably the bulk of what actually happens in the real world. But in the, in the cases that we're all reading about in the paper and we're all getting excited about, to what extent is your preparation for oral argument built around the people you perceive to be the swing votes versus this is my argument, take it or leave it, it'll get the votes or not? Um, so my thinking on this has changed a lot. When I did my Guantanamo case, um, in part because I went to a law school where they don't teach law, I thought that the whole thing was um, around, um, uh, I thought the whole thing was around the individual justices. And, and in particular, I was like, how is Justice O'Connor going to think about this argument? How is Justice Kennedy going to think about that argument? And when I went to the Solicitor General's office, the culture there is very much like, yeah, you want people in the office who know the individual justices. But the most important thing you can do, whether it's in a high profile case or not, is figure out what your position is, those four corners, and test it out. And don't try and sit there and psychoanalyze the individual minds of the justices. Now, obviously, you know, in certain cases, there's a lot of past writings and by an individual justice, and you know that. And you definitely want to think about how can you appeal to that justice. So it's still there. But I think it's far less there, at least in the way I prepare, whether it's a big case or, or, or a more technical one. Um, I'm much more thinking just about the logic of the position. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And in fact, I think the justices don't like it when there's a perception that you're coming in and targeting arguments to them. The other justices certainly don't like it. But even that, the particular justice, and, and, and you know, up until recently, it oftentimes was, was Justice Kennedy. You know, he was known not to like that 
either. So I think you know coming in and trying to telegraph an argument to a particular justice, you know, is usually not a great strategy. Just conversely, you know, having a compelling story to tell um, is the most powerful thing that you can have. Are there differences between, I talked about the hot button cases, the, the not hot button cases that maybe aren't necessarily going to trigger ideological divisions among the court. Are, are there differences in how those arguments unfold or is it all sort of the same? I mean, I think they're night and day. Um, sort of the, the arguments you never hear about, we're, we're going to, you know, there's a disagreement in the courts of appeals about how to interpret this technical bankruptcy provision and all the justices are sort of rolling up their sleeves and figuring out Figuring that out with, with such sort of care and thoughtfulness and diligence that it's, it's really, you know, an amazing thing to see, um, you know, versus the hot button cases where, you know, they're deciding cases, but there's so much, you know, energy in the room and past thinking and positions about it that, you know, as an advocate, you know, you're just going in there, and you're just, you know, waiting for the storm to erupt and you just want to kind of, you know, make it through it, hopefully having told a consistent story and the justices can then go and figure it out. I mean, I, it, my, my wife would say to me before an argument like that, she would say to me, you know, you get very nervous about that because you know that the, the tension is much more, but oftentimes you just say, you know, don't worry, it doesn't really matter what you say because they've thought so much about it, they're sort of going to reach their decision, but, you know, it, it does. I mean, those cases can still go either way. So I, I just think they're sort of night and day in terms of the different kinds of experiences. Yeah, I think that, I think that they are different. Um, and for me, like, one of the things I, I worry about about some of the technical ones is if they're not interested, which does happen sometimes, then there's going to be a unanimous opinion, a 9-0 opinion. And often those 9-0 opinions are not the best because they don't have a dissent that is testing the logic of their position. Um, and so, whereas in the hot button case, there's automatically going to be one. When, um, when, when John Roberts, uh, who ran my Supreme Court practice before, before I got there, he once um, called a client and he said, you know, I've got bad news for you. You lost your case unanimously at the Supreme Court. And the client said, how in the world did that happen? And the chief, then, then Mr. Roberts responded, well, there weren't 10 justices. <laughs> <laughs> You've both done this a long time at this point. Do you still feel nervous when you step up to the lectern? And how do you, how do you manage your nerves? Don't, and, and don't say you imagine the justices in their underwear like Marsha Brady. I 100% am nervous every time. I don't know about you, Greg, but um, you know, it's the kind of thing where if you mess up, you really, you know, it's a little like the Olympics. You, your career's over. I mean, it's not, this is a very competitive bar. And, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure and you want to do a good job for your client. Um, and because of the responsibility of the court, it, whether it's a small case, a technical case, or you know the future of whatever, um, a big one, it's um, something that you really want to do well. So for me, I have the same ritual every before every argument, which is I talk to all three of my boys about the argument the night before, and. Now they're old enough that they can actually get into all the nuances and so on. But even when they were two, four, and six, which is when I started this, um, <laughs> it was actually a very helpful discipline because if you can explain your argument to someone who isn't the most uh, you know, uh, uh, legally trained and so on, it actually helps you figure out what is your argument. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I get nervous, too. I mean, it's, it's just impossible not to, although I think over time it, it tends to be more of like a nervous excitement because it is like a really exhilarating, exciting experience and opportunity to do. Um, in terms of managing it, I think it's, it's the rich role. It's, you know, we've, we've, you've, you've gone through it before. At this point, you kind of know that in all likelihood you're going to survive it. And it's, you know, for me also, it's, it's, it's talking to family members, friends who don't know the case, you know, oftentimes going for a run or something to just sort of like get all that nervous energy out. And then you get up, you're nervous as heck, and you get that first question, you're kind of, you know, there you are, and the 20 minutes flies by. I suspect that both of you prepare in a way that the goal is there will be no question that comes from the bench that you haven't already been asked or at least thought about and you don't have an answer to. Have you ever had any questions that were just so far out of left field that you were, you were 
dumbfounded? What's the, what's the weirdest question you've ever gotten, if you can remember? And you don't have to identify the justice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to identify the question, but it's actually pretty interesting. When you get a sophisticated Supreme Court team together, like I have 15 people on my team, the result is that you pretty much can get um, virtually every question ahead of time, so in, in a moot court. So I've done 25 arguments with this team at my law firm um, before I was in the government, and I think only twice now have I been asked a question that I didn't get asked at the uh, in one of my moot courts. So there is, I mean, with it's a, it's a tremendous advantage. I did get one of those two questions was this past week. Um, I won't identify the question, but, um, um, but so it does happen. Yeah, I think that's largely right. I mean, a big goal of the Supreme Court preparation is thinking of all the questions that could come up. And, and a lot of the weeks leading up to it is just for me is, you know, getting at the computer, you know, questions come at you at all different times. When you're going to bed, when you're in the shower, when you're, you know, driving into work, you get, you know, oftentimes the most important thing is just put that question down and later on you can, you know, think of an answer to it. I mean, the, the most sort of surprising moment for me in that respect came uh, during the, the Fisher argument, the second Fisher argument, which involved a challenge to University of Texas's race conscious admissions plan, where toward the end of the argument, Justice Scalia uh, asked me, essentially, to, to paraphrase, although not very much, what, wasn't it the case, or what do you say about the argument that uh, African-American students are actually better off at lesser schools? And this was an argument that had been made in an amicus brief in the case, so it wasn't out of the blue in that sense, but the, but the, the fact that he said it, and in some ways the way that he said it, I mean, there was literally a gasp in the courtroom, and it was a, you know, a very sort of poignant moment in that respect. And so, and it was, you know, kind of surprising to have to answer that question in that context. But I, I, I think, you know, that question, you know, may have been, you know, one of the critical per turning points of that case. And if I could say two things about that. One is, if you want a model for a beautiful oral argument, no, look no further than Greg's argument in that case, which was pretty magnificent. Um, and two, a word about Justice Scalia. Um, I told you you could predict the questions. You couldn't necessarily predict the tenor of the questions all the time. Um, and Justice Scalia was an incredibly, incredibly vigorous questioner. And uh, Oyes.org is a, a website that has the audio of all oral arguments, I think from 1950 or so on. And you can see what happens in 1986 when he joins the court. The before and after is unbelievable. Before, you really could go and give speeches um, at the court as an advocate. Afterwards, it's these 70 questions per half hour kind of thing. Um, and I remember you know, he passed away on February, I think, 13th or 14th, a couple of years ago, and I had an argument a month after that, and, and it's no secret that he used to come after me really hard in arguments, um, and and I like to give it back to him. And I remember I walked out of the court after that March argument, and I did have a tear in my eye um, because he really was a unbelievably magnificent questioner. Yeah, and, and he didn't, I mean, he asked tough questions of all advocates, but, but more than any other justice, I think he loved the give and take. He loved it when you came back with great answers, as Neil, Neil Wood, and, and, you know, he loved that exchange. And there is, you know, especially in the year following his passing, there was a, a noticeable, um, you know, absence on the court. So even though you guys are at the top of your field, I'm wondering, do you find yourself at the night after the argument lying in bed thinking of all the answers you wished you'd given? I actually don't. I, I, once I do an argument, I put it in a box, and I generally don't. Don't don't think about it, um, and you know I probably should. It might make me better, but I just um, for me, I, it's better for me to just move on to the next thing. I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Justice Jackson said there, there are three arguments in every case: the one you prepare to give, the one you give, and the one you wish you gave. Uh, I, I do. I I, I lay it, uh, lay in bed at night that night thinking, oh, I wish I said that. So I wish I said that. Interesting. Well, for what it's worth, when when writing opinions. I often think of the questions I wished I'd asked. So um, let's shift a little bit and talk about the role of Solicitor General. Um, do you want, 
tell us a little bit in general for people who don't know what the job of the Solicitor General is, and then we'll drill down a little. So it's, as Greg said, it's this 20-person office, um, uh, unbelievably talented lawyers in that office. I mean, when I did hiring, we'd get 250 applications for a single position, a line attorney position, and you know, at least 50 of them had clerked at the Supreme Court. So it is an unbelievable list uh, of people. Um, they, uh, the line attorneys argue two to three cases a year. There are four deputies in the office. Um, three of them are career. The one with the fewest number of arguments, Malcolm Stewart, I think has like 85 Supreme Court arguments or something like that. Ed Needler, the senior most, has I think 139 or so arguments. Uh, I think you know right now having the, the record for the most arguments of a current practitioner um, before the court. There are only two political positions in that office, the Solicitor General and the Principal Deputy. Everyone else is career. And up until this administration, that has meant basically pretty much a non-politicized office. They take the same positions. Um, when I came into the office in 2009, actually Greg and I remember we had coffee right before I came in. He was the Solicitor General, and I was going to be the senior political person in the office because Kagan was going to take some months to get confirmed. And I remember going over some positions with him. So he was telling me the hot button cases and other things about the office, which was, I'm so grateful. It was just such a lovely transition to be able to just seamlessly do that. But I looked at every position that he had taken and that his predecessor, Paul Clement, had taken, and we did not change position in a single case, not one. Um, and there were some hot button things the president cared a lot about, um, but we stayed with it. Um, and um, that's generally been the tradition of the office. Um, unfortunately, this solicitor general hasn't continued that tradition. So who, when you're the solicitor general, who's your client? Who makes these decisions? Well, I mean, the, the president and the attorney general, you report to them. And so ultimately, um, you know, you care a lot about what they think. But the Solicitor General's office really traditionally has an extraordinary degree of autonomy and independence um, by tradition. And, and I think that's because people appreciate that um, the Supreme Court you know, cares about what the Solicitor General says because it thinks it's getting advice about the legal position of the United States that is not necessarily going to change from one administration to the next. And so I think by tradition, there's an attitude that we're going to let the Solicitor General decide what the position of the United States should be. Other people are going to have input, um, but really the, the Solicitor General has an extraordinary um, degree of autonomy in making those, those calls, which is, which is pretty amazing given the importance of the United States before the Supreme Court. Uh, and that, that, you know, that's not true in, in every case, and the person making that decision is making it in light of um, the administration's priorities and policies, but at least for the eight years that I was in the office, it was more of a situation where we were advising the White House of what we were planning to do as opposed to going to get permission to do that. And maybe the best example of that is the Heller um, case about the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms where um, the Solicitor General was Paul Clement at the time, the government's brief was sort of like a middle of the road brief, recognizing individual right to bear arms, but not necessarily taking a position on the outcome of the case. And uh, the Vice President of the United States um, apparently didn't like our position uh, too much because he actually joined an amicus brief going further than the SG United States position in his capacity as President of the Senate. And so you think of that, that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, he's the vice president. You think if he really wanted to, he could just tell the Solicitor General like what to do, but instead he went and filed a, a separate amicus brief, and you had that uh, a brief by the United States reflecting the position as the SG saw fit. So I don't know if this question is truly applicable to the SG role or not. Um, the Attorney General typically defends the constitutionality of executive branch action or statutes passed by Congress. Now, by my reckoning, Neil was a solicitor general during a period when Attorney General, general Holder announced that the Justice Department would no longer defend the Defense of Marriage Act. Question one is, do those kinds of decisions, uh, are, are you making those kinds of decisions in the context of the solicitor general, maybe not that particular one? And then question two is, um, is it ever appropriate 
not to defend, in, in that role, not to defend the executive branch action or the constitutionality of statute? And if so, what, how do you figure out when your job requires you to suck it up and go and make an argument that maybe you don't support versus no, this isn't okay? I mean, I think it's the hardest thing I faced in the office was the question of when to decline something, to decline to defend something because you think it's so obviously unconstitutional, it cannot be defended. Um, I erred on the side because I believe very much in the adversarial system that if there's a reasonable argument that can be made, even if it's one that you know offends you morally, that the argument should be made and that you are to defend the constitutionality of the act. And this goes to your prior question, who's your client? For me, I viewed my client as not the president of the United States, even though he gave me my position. It was the United States, and in particular Congress, because oftentimes these are statutes passed by Congress. And in the example you give about the Defense of Marriage Act, I don't, don't want to get into the particulars of that case, but I will note that the president... Obama made the decision not to defend that congressional statute. It wasn't made at the attorney general level or the mere acting solicitor general level. It was made by the president himself. But in the wake of that, states' attorneys general uh, around the country, some of whom were answerable to their governors and some of whom weren't, depending on the structure of the individual state, followed suit. And I'm just wondering how you think about uh, the role of a government lawyer in those settings. I don't know. And maybe you can't add more than you have. Well, I mean, I would second Neil's point about the importance of defending the constitutionality of acts of Congress, defending, I mean, I was on the other side of the 9-11 cases where I was working in the Solicitor General's office during the 9-11 attacks, and the president went to the Solicitor General and said, look, these cases are going to be so, they're so important and they're so likely to get to the Supreme Court that we want lawyers in your office to handle it. So we actually, you know, handled in the district court, the Court of Appeals, and the Supreme Court. And, and you know, it was very challenging litigation against the best lawyers in the country. Um, the government lost some of the cases. It won some of the cases. But you're there as a government attorney. You know, you're, you're defending your client, making the best arguments you can, thinking about the limits of it for sure. But I, mean, I think part of the ethos of the office, and actually by statute, you're required to, you know, instinctively defend the constitutionality of things. So you mentioned and you, you, you pointed to Neil when you were talking about the finest lawyers on the other side. My understanding is that the one time these two gentlemen have faced off so far is in the district court, federal district court, uh, in, in around those cases. You want to talk a little bit about that? So um, I uh, filed the Guantanamo case in Seattle because uh, normally you file these cases in D.C., but D.C. had really terrible law for us. So I came up with this way to file the case in Seattle by having a Navy attorney um, represent uh, my client, who was bin Laden's driver, um, and we filed it with him as the next friend in Seattle. So Greg and I fly out to Seattle to argue this case um, over there. And, you know, that's a very unusual role for the office. It happened for the best of reasons for the post 9-11 cases. Um, and it kind of happened for us in the Obama administration with the Affordable Care Act, um, in which the moment that that law became um, in effect, the president asked me to um, kind of spearhead and supervise all of the litigation, even the litigation in the district court. Um, and obviously you work with the amazingly talented trial lawyers at the department who know what they're doing in trial court, as I don't. Um, but, uh, but, but that's a, a unique function that the office sometimes performs. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, I, I remember um, it, it was, a, I think it was a, the motion to transfer, right? The government was trying to get the case transferred to DC where Neil won it anyway. But um, we were out there and I think the hearing got canceled or something. We ended up being out there for a couple of days, but yeah, it was fun. So I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about the Supreme Court confirmation process. When I was Googling you all um, to prepare, because that's what we all do now, um, I found videos of Greg discussing uh, Supreme Court nominee, then it was uh, nominee Brett Kavanaugh's approach to business and administrative law. Uh, Neil, you famously uh, introduced then nominee uh, Neil Gorsuch, uh, Judge Gorsuch, at his confirmation hearings and advocated for his confirmation, which was a move that surprised some people because you had served in a democratic administration. Surprising is a euphemism. Um. <laughs> so, so the question that that raises for me is, uh, I, I think the pendulum swings back and forth around the question of the extent to which a judge's 
ideological compatibility uh, as opposed to sort of legal chops and pedigree uh, are, are appropriate considerations in the confirmation process. And I'd be very interested to hear what each of you has to say about that. Yeah, so for me, um, I didn't think the Gorsuch thing was a very hard call. I mean, first of all, you know, President Trump had won the election, and um, I assumed he was going to nominate Judge Judy. So, like, you know, anything was a step up from, <laughs> from, from, from that. Um, um, in, in reality, you know, I had the privilege of serving as Elena Kagan's deputy solicitor general and was there for, you know, for her nomination and confirmation. And it really bothered me that Republicans voted against her um, because um, you know, she's just about one of the most qualified individuals to have ever served on in, at the Supreme Court. And you know, obviously, you're not going to like all of her ideology, but you're going to have a great justice who's going to work hard to do the right thing. And so it bothered me that there were Republicans who voted against her a lot. And when Justice, when uh, now Justice Gorsuch was nominated, I felt the same thing. Like, look, I'm not going to like a lot of the opinions that he's going to issue and the votes he's going to cast. But to me, um, did he meet the standards for being a Supreme Court justice? Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And it was a great thing, of Neil, to have done. Um, when I left as Solicitor General, I actually got a call from... Um, the Obama White House to see if I would testify on behalf of Elena Kagan, who had been nominated to Supreme Court, and I agreed to do it, um, essentially for the same reasons as Neil. I mean, I think I was going to agree with her necessarily in every case, but she was superbly qualified, and, you know, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of political drama, increasingly so, obviously, surrounding those nominations, but I think it's, it, it's good for the Senate to hear from people just sort of within the parameters of the the sort of legal considerations that we deal with, you know, and going before the court, that these are, you know, good people, qualified people who, you know, even if you disagree with them in terms of where their views might take them in this case or that, you know, are people who, you know, should, are certainly qualified to serve in the Supreme Court well. In some of the high profile cases, and I'm thinking about things like Hamdan or perhaps the travel ban case, um, there's a lot going on outside of the courtroom at the same time. As an advocate who's preparing to go argue to the Supreme Court, to what extent do you either, A, try to influence the conversation outside of the courtroom, or B, feel the need to explain or respond to things that are happening in the outside conversation when you get into the court? I think one of the best things about the Supreme Court is that the, you generally just don't do any of that stuff. Your audience is nine people. And... I don't think they're particularly influenced by the conversation outside the building. Um, it, you know, so, and, and even if they are, there's just so little you can do as an advocate to try and shape that. So I think in lower courts, sometimes I'll be involved in big pitch battles where there is a public relations component of it. But at the Supreme Court, I just, uh, it's not going to work. Sorry, I just discovered that I've gone on too long, or I've let us go on too long. Um, so I appreciate it. This has been wonderful. I've learned so much, and thank you all for thank listening. You. And thank you.